Supercross is a spectacular and dangerous sport that has the fans around Australia flocking to the tracks. Last year alone, 8,000 patrons were on hand at the Newcastle Motodrome to watch these two wheel wizards strut their stuff. Because of that tremendous support in 89, Newcastle has been chosen to launch this year's Masters Series and everyone who is anyone in the sport is here for round one. We've got the best riders in Australia competing here and we've also brought Jeff Hicks from America. Jeff is very keen to get involved in our series this year. There's six rounds and he's flying in for every one of them, so he regards it as an important uh, aspect in his career. Greg Scott, Dale Britton, Stephen Andrew and Phil Robinson were the first riders to test the track and even at half pace turned on some sensational moves, emphasising the appeal the fast growing sport has. In 1986 there were three events on the calendar, in 1990 there were something like 35 or 36 events stretching from Darwin to, uh, to Perth. We're doing six events and we're doing them in Newcastle the first round tonight, we're doing them in Adelaide the Tennis Centre, the National Tennis Centre in Melbourne, Sydney Entertainment Centre and also in Brisbane. So it's, uh, it's really a boom sport. It could be the sport of the 90s. At 19 years of age, Guy Andrews is the equal youngest competitor in the Uncle Toby series and with thoughts of the Newcastle disaster as motivation, he put up a tremendous effort to be second to the all-conquering Guy Leach. Andrews has dedicated a lot of time to his chosen sport over the past few seasons and now all the hard work is beginning to pay off. Race favourite Leach crossed the line with plenty of space between himself and Andrews with North Bondi Scott Thompson in third spot. The World Windsurfing Championships continued on Lake Macquarie today with a slalom being contested. Borigal's Adam Quinn again dominated the light heavyweight division with two wins and a second from his three starts and he is now qualified for next Sunday's final. His main opposition is from overseas with cousins John and Tony Philp from Fiji and Ian Johnson from the United Kingdom pushing Quinn all the way. The other divisions are on the water at the moment. Also on Belmont Bay at the moment is the 50th anniversary Australian VJ titles, making the lake a sea of colour. A lot of the nation's top skippers have come through the VJ ranks, including successful America's Cup skipper John Bertram, who was Australian champ way back in 1963-64. This year, 63 entries are chasing the ultimate prize, and there's nothing in the senior or junior divisions after four heats. Dean Williams in Paranoid has stretched his lead in the seniors with a fine win in heat four, with Craig Hoare in Floyd hanging on for second. In the juniors, Runaway sailed a brilliant race to win heat four, with Ripoff in second place. John Boyd selling John D closed the gap on championship leader Danny Anderson in Notorious by finishing in third spot today. Bruce Shepard has seen earthquake damage in Mexico City, Armenia and San Francisco. By world standards, a quake of 5.5 is small and Bruce says Novocastrians can recover. Because people are inexperienced, it looks very hazardous to them and I can understand people saying that it has to be demolished. But frankly, if the hazards are secured, if the overhanging parapets, the, the dangerous parts are secured, uh, much of this can be economically saved and rebuilt. But to rebuild, Shepherd says the city must consider new building regulations. Newcastle has suffered two quakes before and simple low cost changes could be made to protect from further tragedy. Well, with the event of this earthquake, it should be reconsidered. Again, one can understand the, the lack of earthquake design provision. It happens but once in a lifetime, and people are reluctant to put extra expense into anything that may or may not happen in their lifetime. Civil engineer Robert Melchers from Newcastle University says properly built buildings withstood the quake without problems. He said from a general view the buildings which did come down were structurally unsound. The main damage has been, in my view, restricted to buildings that have not been well maintained, that have been altered, that have had problems in the past. Every day, new heroes emerge from the earthquake aftermath. Few have earned more praise than Norm Duffy. Even as he lay unconscious and unidentified in intensive care, paramedics were marvelling at this man's bravery. 
For five hours, he lay in the ruins of the workers' club. Despite his own massive injuries, he gave all to two women trapped alongside him, holding their hands and reassuring them help was on the way. Even today, as he lay seriously ill in a special care ward, his spirit never faltered. <laughs> Norm and wife Miriam had made a rare visit to the club that day to renew their membership. They paused briefly to play the poker machines when the quake struck. His wife of 38 years didn't survive the terrifying ordeal. Norm, you've gone through so much, yet you're still smiling. How do you manage to... Yeah, that's false, man. False. I'm trying to avoid that, the other thing, you know, till I get out. Either way, you know. As Norm Duffy comforted fellow victims, in another part of the club, Patrick Murray, a roadie for that night's rock concert, lay alone and trapped. What were you thinking as you, as you were laying there? I you know, this ain't no way to die. <laughs> Patrick was in the auditorium when the earthquake struck. Realising the roof was collapsing, he rushed to a backstage room. Thought about how you know, those people in San Francisco, how they survived in those cars all that time. So he decided just to relax, stay calm and try and conserve as much energy as I could. Another survivor, Mary Einman. Finding she had time on her hands as she arrived for her regular game of hoy, she stopped to play the five-cent poker machines. Ten minutes later, she lay dazed and injured, trapped under piles of rubble. The trouble is you, you, you don't know whether you're going to be saved or not until uh, you see the light where they are coming in. Because everything was piled up on top of you, everything was black. Today, as she lies in a hospital bed next to the woman who played the poker machine alongside her, Mary Einman says she's emerged as a winner. You know, having your life compared to the others that are gone, biggest jackpot in the world. I was just going to put some more five cents in after winning the jackpot. I was going to put more, some more into the machine. And it danced in front of me and all these bricks came from everywhere. And they all went under me and I fell back onto them. That's how I've, I've uh, fractured my spine. 81-year-old Runa McElwain probably collected the last jackpot paid from the workers. Her good fortune soon turned to horror. Yeah, I could hear one poor man saying, oh, if you don't get me soon, I'll be gone. Perhaps one of the most remarkable tales of survival comes from Hamilton. Jacqueline Rowe was near the ill-fated Kent Hotel when everything collapsed around her and her two babies. She pushed 10-month-old Alana clear of the wreckage, but 23-month-old PJ lay buried under piles of rubble. As I just kept screaming out for PJ, you know, all I could hear was mum, mum. And I just kept screaming for someone to help me get him out. And then five young guys come along and they said, what's the matter? I said, look, my son's under all that. All I could see when he was there was this little boy laying on the ground with all this stuff over him. I thought he was dead. PJ escaped with a fractured skull and abrasions. His mother still lies in hospital with back injuries, but he's now safe and happy with his grandmother. As, as you lay here in, in the hospital bed, what, what's going through your mind? Everything that happened last Thursday. I'm still trying to forget it, but I can't do that. Especially when you've got a 23-month-old baby that nearly died from it. Come close to death from it with all that stuff over there. Do you feel lucky? I feel very lucky. So there's so many people that didn't survive that quake. And for all the people that did, they got out of it very lucky. The Lifeline counselling phone service has been running hot since last Thursday's quake. Many callers have found themselves simply devastated by the quake, either through losses of property or unable to cope emotionally. Lifeline counsellors listen unjudgmentally to all calls and offer assistance through further face-to-face -face interviews or by trying to organise assistance with finance companies. Councillors now fear as pre-Christmas spending bills start to roll in that many people will become depressed at their inability to repay them now they are financially devastated by the quake.
The quake officially measured 5.5 on the Richter scale, 7 is considered catastrophic. It attracted long-running international media attention and for the close-knit Hunter community was a devastating loss of life. The damage bill is expected to run to around one and a half billion dollars. It's hard to believe that just seven days have passed since 1027, Thursday the 28th of December 1989. At this moment, a week ago, Newcastle was going about its business when the earthquake struck. The days that followed saw anguish, heartbreak, courage, determination and now sheer hard work as the city slowly restores order out of chaos. A falling television camera has become the most widely seen picture of the actual quake, but the images of the destruction it brought will be far more enduring. The crippled form of the Newcastle Workers Club has been seen across the world. This was by far the biggest casualty in terms of loss of lives and the building itself. A week later, the scene is almost unrecognisable. The machines have done their work with brutal efficiency and the rooms open past jagged edges into the open air where the western half was. Beaumont Street, Hamilton was the location of the other earthquake deaths and a scene of devastation last Thursday, shop owners and pedestrians wandering in shock. A week later the scene is very different but equally alien. The bricks and broken awnings have been cleared away, leaving the strange sight of a clean road lined with shattered buildings. The only pedestrians are officials carefully staying away from the footpaths. The tremor fatally wounded the junction motor in. It was severely cracked and leaning ominously, had to wait almost a week before the overworked machines could complete the job. Today, nothing was left but small pieces of rubble, rapidly being gulped by the excavators and shuttled away in the dump trucks. 
The old Century Theatre at Broadmeadow was also seriously damaged last Thursday. It was assessed to be unsavable and is well on the way to disappearing altogether. Last Thursday, in fact, signalled the end of many buildings which, in different circumstances, would have warranted far greater ceremony at their passing. Although the rebuilding has begun in many places, this is a site that Navicastrians are going to have to get used to, at least in the short term. Vacant blocks where landmarks once stood. On this patch of dirt was the old Broadway Hotel at Broadmeadow. Demolishers have left nothing of it but the fire stairs and memories. And memories are what Navicastrians have a lot of. Memories which will take some time to deal with. A week later, the individual stories are still emerging. George Adams had stepped out of his car for some shopping at Hamilton. The quake deposited a ton of bricks on its roof. I saw all the brickwork on it, but uh, I didn't... Uh, at that moment, I realised even the loss of the car was only minor compared to all the damage that I'd seen. Although most in the inner city escaped physical injury, their property did not. A week later, it's clear the massive clean-up will take many months. It will take much more than a week too before movement again fills these streets and the hollow sound of sirens stop filling the air. Ross Hampton, NBN News. The fleet might not have included every man and his dog, but the starting line was certainly full as the heats continued in the men's course racing. In shifting 12 knot winds, they raced 7 kilometres around a triangle section. In the lightweight division, Central Coast sailor Chris Lawrence was a class ahead, but not far behind came Lex, Glenn, Lathan, Kane, all members of the Jones family of Charlestown. Lex, what's it like when you're competing against your sons? Oh, it's pretty hard work. They're all out to beat me and I get a really hard time if they do when we get home. <laughs> so it's pretty hot stuff on the water. The family began six years ago with one sailboard. Now they own eight. Trying to keep up with the Joneses are the other 264 sailors in the titles. Yeah, the, the organisation is it's quite good. Yes, and um, there's a lot of uh, people, so it's very interesting. And Australians are very good, yes. In Europe, we, we all saw that the Australian was not so good. The windsurfers have come from 12 different countries to compete. The finals of the women's course racing were decided this afternoon, with America's Laney Butler taking the honours. Aussie star Jessica Crisp just outpointed Newcastle's Sharon Richardson for second place. What's the feeling like out on the water? Um, stick on top of the people who are trying to beat you <laughs> and hope you can go fast. <laughs> Racing will continue tomorrow with the rerun of the controversial marathon at 1.30. But the spirit of the championships is not all controversy and competition. For the Italian team, it's also a chance for a good time. Nine o'clock and business life began returning to the city centre. Or at least that's what the city council had hoped. For many owners this was their first opportunity to enter buildings and there were vivid reminders of the day the quake hit. Most owners spent the day cleaning up or preparing for post-Christmas clearance sales which they'd missed. The stores that did open reported business to be slow. At this hour of the morning it's not quite usual. We've got very, very quiet at the moment, but I think, and this, as I've been here since about 8 o'clock, it is gradually building up. So whether it's just people wandering around having a look at things, what's happened, or whether they are here on business, I don't know. 
Customers may have been rare, but there were plenty of sightseers. Repair work is underway in many parts of the city. Although most of the rubble is being cleared from the streets, the punishment that shook Hunter Street is clear. Barriers surround unsafe buildings and makeshift walkways have been erected. Police are also patrolling the city, keeping a close eye on suspect buildings as well as traffic. The police had hoped to limit the traffic flow into the CBD by providing car parks on the perimeter and reducing the speed limit to 30 kilometres an hour. Unfortunately, most people were oblivious to the changed speed limit and few decided to use the shuttle service provided by Newcastle buses and there were better ways of manoeuvring around the barriers. Businesses know it will take months for life to return to the city, but they're confident it will happen. After all, if you can survive an earthquake, you can survive anything. There's a lot of lot of places that haven't opened from what I can see and um, where our business is going to really suffer within the next few weeks. If not, this year is going to be a very, very hard year for us to see us through. In early December, Landcom bulldozers moved into the site at the end of James C. Drive, Arena to begin clearing work for a cul-de-sac to accommodate 20 new housing blocks. The land that is being cleared is believed to be one of the last turpentine forests left on the central coast. Residents with homes backing onto the land are concerned over the development and immediately set up a tent on site blocking entry. Erina Residents Action Group spokesperson Anne Howe says if the dozers come back, they won't be afraid to lay down in front of them. I think if it came to that, we would get a lot of support, actually, the way people are getting so annoyed about it now. Gosford City Council Mayor Kim Margin says his aldermen are behind the residents and agree the land should be preserved. A spokesman for Lancome late this afternoon said the development has got council approval and residents were always aware when they bought their Lancome blocks that further development would go ahead. However, the department will entertain the idea of selling the blocks to council if they come up with an agreeable market price. Until then, Lancome will continue with roadworks, hoping to have initial work completed by next week. The figures show that of 142 police killed in the line of duty in the last 50 years, 32 were killed in motorcycle accidents. Our statistics uh, indicate that police uh, are not very good riders of horses and motorcycles, that there are a high number of deaths in that area. Although police admit safety is a problem, a report has found bikes are simply too expensive to run. Obviously, the police organisation now has to be run like a business. We carried out evaluations here in Newcastle and found that the cost of running motorcycles was 50% higher than running the similar number of motor cars. A cost effectiveness study by Inspector Kevin Curry has shown three BMW 1000cc bikes cost in excess of $5,000 to maintain over 30,000 kilometres. Three cars were only $3,000. Six motorcycles have been based in Newcastle. That number will come down to two. Gosford will also be cut to two. The police bike riders say the extra manoeuvrability of the BMWs will be missed in the city. Now, with the officers set to be transferred to car duties, morale is low. Well, I had one chap who's even talking about resigning. Um, other chaps or other people were talking about getting out of the highway patrol, going to another branch. They, uh, they're just demoralised by it and uh, they're very disappointed with it. <laughs> 